I will be speaking in English, so not to mislead. So my name is Anum Parvatir. I work for an organization called eHealth Africa. We are based in Kano, Nigeria, and we work across the West African region in both English and French-speaking West Africa. We are a social enterprise. We are working to get better insight into public health. Uh, we're 750 people strong, mostly West Africans, uh, and we are hiring. I will put that out at the very beginning. Uh, we build and operationalize data systems um, to do things like stop the transmission of Ebola. We were very involved in the 2014 and 2015 Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Uh, we deliver vaccines, directly deliver vaccines from the state to health facilities to make sure that people, even in the most remote regions, can have access to uh, essential commodities. And then we do things like, you know, use data systems to support polio eradication in Africa. And that's actually what I'm here to, to talk about today. So why polio? What is polio? Um, so let me, you know, give you, to give you some context, in 1988, the year that the Global Polio Eradication Initiative was founded, there were 350,000 cases of polio in the world, of paralytic polio. In 2016, that number was 37. And that's really remarkable when you think about it. When you look at the case reduction, uh, you know, that hasn't come easy. It is not a coincidence. It is because of diligence and sustained effort on behalf of a lot of people, including governments and partners and, and vaccinators on the ground. But before we go further, what is polio? Uh, polio is a virus. It can cause an irreversible flaccid paralysis, so you lose your, the ability to, to use your limbs. Uh, by, it, and the virus attacks your motor neurons. Uh, it has very, very high transmission rates. It's in incredibly infectious. But not everybody who, gets, who contracts the virus will show symptoms. So there are a lot of silent carriers. Only about 1 in 200 will show any symptoms of polio. Uh, it's transmitted through the fecal oral route, meaning that you, uh, the virus propagates in your gut. You, if you ingest uh, contaminated water, it propagates and you shed it in your stool and it re-enters the water supply. So in this way, it is transmitted, in, especially in areas with, um, with open sewer systems and uh, very close populations living, living in high proximity. Uh, the symptoms are most commonly seen in children, so it disproportionately affects uh, children, their immune systems are weaker, they're, they're, they have less immunity to fend off the virus. And there is no known cure. But there are effective vaccines, and the vaccines have been around for, for 60 plus years. In the 1950s, uh, the, the Salk vaccine was developed. There we go. Uh, so stopping, so how do we do, you know, you, you have a vaccine, what does that actually mean? Stopping the transmission of polio requires us to vaccinate huge amounts of people. You know, we thought 80%, now 95%. We're really trying to get up to 100% of people in an area. And, that, and to do that, you know, to get to the very end of the virus, we really have to get as many people as possible. Uh, the challenge, though, is finding the children. So polio can persist in pockets. You know, a lot of you have been to places like this. This is in, in northern Nigeria, just outside of Kano. Um, and can, again, I mentioned high birth rates, close quarters, open sewers. Uh, and and th these are the conditions that can have the virus circulate for years at a time, and sometimes undetected for years. When that population, you know, this, uh, if a population is living in a pocket and the virus is circulating among them, suddenly something external is introduced. Maybe somebody comes to visit their family from far away, or uh, somebody travels to visit somebody for Eid or something else. Um, or somebody flees their home because of an act of insurgency, such as Boko Haram in the northeast of Nigeria. The virus can move as well. And because then you're introducing a virus uh, in, a, in this population that's been circulating to a, maybe another population that hasn't been uh, vaccinated as well, this is how you end up with an outbreak. So when we started, when we started in Nigeria with, with the big push against polio and, and late, uh, or in 2012, uh, finding every child looked a little bit like this map that you see. You go into health facilities now in northern Nigeria and you see tons of these hand-drawn maps. And this is how vaccinators would find every child. Uh, 
In Nigeria, in 2012, the national government and, and you know, the national primary health care emergency, or the national primary health care development agency, as well as the Polio Emergency Operations Center, decided that they wanted to do something different. They wanted to look for better data to help get rid of this virus. And so we started with geospatial data. We, we made a push for better maps. And uh, basically, you know, instead of giving a vaccinator this, we thought, what can we do to make this easier? How can we make sure that this map is an accurate rep representation of what is happening on the ground? And so how? How do you do that? You start with imagery. Uh, and so we did. We started with uh, satellite imagery, high resolution satellite imagery, and did a feature extraction on top of that to find out where are the houses. You know, you look at your imagery and you can say, here is a settlement, here is what looks like a big building, maybe it's a school or, or a hospital or something of the like. Uh, but imagery alone is not enough. Right? If I give you just a satellite image of your hometown, you may know, okay, this is my house, and this is the school, and this is my park, but that doesn't necessarily help you get to every single place where children might be. Right? Uh, you need, imagery itself is hard, you need to make the map useful. Uh, and how you do that is you ground truth the map. So we send out data collectors to as many places as possible. And they're equipped with either a tablet or a mobile phone that has GPS capabilities. And they take that, they take that imagery map and they ground truth it. They say, you know, I am at this location at these coordinates and this is, um, this is a mosque and it's called, you know, uh, it's called Kofar Mata Mosque or this is a school or this is a pop, you know, this is a settlement that maybe nobody has come to before and the name of that settlement is Dala whatever it might be. And when you couple that high level imagery with the, the base level uh, data collection, you, then you come up with a map that really means something, right? Not only that, when you send out a data collector to do something like this, you also end up involving the, the local government and local leadership with them. You cannot do this on your own. You cannot just send data collectors to go and collect that information without involvement, right? You, when you pull in the local government, then that map becomes real to them. What used to look like a hand-drawn map with a river and a few houses on it now becomes something that is real and, and meaningful and often has a lot more context than you would have had before. And we found in that process that local government finds places that they did not know existed on the map before. And by virtue of that, every time a vaccinator goes out and goes to a new place, they end up finding more and more places that have never been visited, shrinking the places that, that are at risk for polio. And so once you, once you believe in that map, when, when your worldview switches from what that paper map was to what this new map looks like, and you really believe that as a local government, that enables a lot of different things, right? Uh, it enables you to use that map. Once you believe that this is what is happening in the world, uh, you can measure against it. And this is what has happened with polio in Nigeria. Uh, we send out vaccination teams, often women, walking house to house to house, trying to find every single child. And they carry with them in their pockets a mobile phone, an Android smartphone. It does not need to be connected to a network. It just has to have the GPS on. And that GPS is taking a ping every 90 seconds. Um, and it's storing in the phone's memory where that phone has been all day. And at the end of the day, you know, you, you plug the phone into the network and it gets pushed through what we call the vaccination tracking system. And the VTS can tell you where, where that vaccinator has been and more importantly, where the vaccinator has not been. Uh, and when you do that, you can also use an algorithm to say, you know, they were moving too fast, they were in a car, that could not be a vaccination track. So you end up with valid tracks and invalid tracks. And at the end, you know, from, for your, just your vaccination team, you know where you have been, but then you also know for all the other teams in the area, where have, where have we been? For all the teams in the state, where have we been? And the end of the day, you get your coverage map and you get the places where you need to go tomorrow. And the government gets, or you know, the local authority gets a, an idea of what was missed and where do we need to send more teams? Where can we divert people for tomorrow? So that is incredibly powerful. 
the vaccinators carry phones. The phones record GPS points. The points are overlaid onto the base map, and we get daily coverage data. And this is the bread and butter of the Nigeria polio eradication program. We work with an organization uh, called Novelty to help implement the system, the Gates Foundation, WHO, and obviously the national government of Nigeria. Uh, and this has made a huge difference. You know, this is what is being used in the Lake Chad Basin now in the active outbreak that is going on there. And this is publicly accessible. It is vts.eocng.org, and anyone can access the system and take a look at the latest coverage data uh, and the base maps for, for what's going on in northern Nigeria. So what do these, what does that mean? You know, these, these literally hundreds of millions of valid tracks that have been collected since 2012, what, what is the actual impact? And I, I could tell you how many tracks and how many doses of vaccine that corresponds to, but I think this is the most important number uh, that matters to us. In, a, in 2012, before the system was implemented, there were 122 cases of wild polio virus uh, infections detected in Nigeria. The year it was implemented, that, that number dropped by more than half to 53. And in 2014, we saw a huge reduction to six cases. Since July of 2014, there have been four cases of wild polio virus in the Lake Chad Basin in Nigeria. And we think that is really remarkable. We're not there yet. It's not perfect. You know, the base maps require constant refining and the system requires constant updating. But we're making a dent. And it's, and it's you know, the, the results speak for themselves. And so I'm almost done, I promise. Uh, the, what, so when you have a base map and you can see results like this, you know, this, we, we see these results in 2014. We all know what happened in 2014 in West Africa. There was a, a big Ebola outbreak. When you have a government, when you have local authorities that believe in the power of accurate base maps, it can change the game in how other things are responded to. Uh, they can, base maps can enable data-driven decision-making across an entire health system. A great example was finding and following up uh, on Ebola exposure in Lagos, and then it, after Lagos, Sierra Leone, uh, Guinea, and Liberia, through contact tracing. In addition to that, there are lots of other things you can do. You can, you know, from a health system strengthening perspective, you can build a registry of all of the health facilities in an area and map services to them and find out where your coverage gaps are. In, you know, where are your midwives? Where are your lab, uh, where is your lab capacity? Uh, where do you have tertiary care? Where do you have cold chain, et cetera, et cetera? And you can start building this dynamic system that, that stays up to date on um, all the things that are possible in your health system. Similarly, you can use it for disease surveillance. Once you, once you have built a system and a base map of what is happening on the ground, you can use that system to find out where are my outbreaks happening. You can send out surveillance officers and overlay your, your case maps with your base maps. Uh, and yes. then, again, placing labs in strategic areas based on where your cases are happening, where your, uh, where your existing lab capacity and where your existing health capacity is. So just one example of how one intervention can really scale into lots of other things and change the game and change the way people think about what data-driven decisions actually are. Très, très rapidement. Very, very, very quickly, please. Sure. Last slide here. Uh, the, so we have, uh, there, it's not perfect, as I mentioned. There are definitely challenges. A map requires updating all the time. Uh, people move. The health facilities close down. Rainy season roads get shut down. And you have to make sure that, uh, that your base map is accurate and reflects all of these things. And so it requires, you know, we try to leverage as much of, of crowdsourced data as possible. When we send out other disease surveillance officers, we try to collect information, for example. And that's something that's happening right now in Borno in the Lake Chad Basin. As these areas have, ne have not been accessed for years because of active insurgency, we can now use the people who are going to collect information on what's going on there and find out what is accessible, what is not accessible. Uh, and the last big challenge is community acceptance. Again, getting people to understand that this is the map of the community based on the imagery as well as the ground truth and bringing that understanding together is a big challenge, but one that is very worthwhile to meet. <laughs>